I have a little different sermon for you this morning. I thought you might enjoy it, and I thought it might be helpful. It's something I had not planned to put into a sermon, but I thought I would, and it, it's an experience I had during the feast that uh, has just stuck with me over the last few weeks. And I'll tell you how it started. For those of you that don't know, uh, I, I volunteered to help and travel whatever during the feast, wherever they needed me. So uh, this particular year I had eight plane flights uh, during the week. And usually I talk and interact with people occasionally. I, I like to kind of mind my own business and I, I like to let people have space and not overcrowd them and, and keep them in conversation. But I had an interesting conversation with a lady that uh, was on an Air Canada flight between Toronto and Vancouver. And I got, sit, I got seated, I, got, I was sit between two ladies, and the one lady wanted to talk. And I had just purchased the book Killing Patton, and I was really into it, and I was not really planning to do much talking. I wanted to read because I was loving this book on the history of it and, and what took place during World War II. But she started talking the minute she sat down as we were taking off, and she never quit. And when we started talking, she immediately said that, uh, you're not from Canada, are you? And I said, no. And two or three people across the aisle started talking, and they said, no, we can tell you're not from Canada by the way you're talking. Well, I had no idea what that was like. And they, they later, when I told them I was from Texas, said, we figured you were from the southern part of the U.S., either Oklahoma or Texas. But we started talking, and she told me that she was a retired school teacher, had been, been a science teacher most of her life, but now that she was doing consulting work for large companies, she traveled a lot, and she, she worked with big corporations, oil companies, and she was really involved with her second career since she had retired from teaching. And she said, what in the world is somebody from Texas doing flying from Toronto to Vancouver. <laughs> and I, I proceeded to open my mouth too much, I guess. But I told her that I had lived in Canada years ago in the late 70s. My children were born there. And that I had uh, still knew, I still knew some people up here and we were having some important church meetings. And I was going to be there meeting some of the people again. And, and they were old friends and we had kept in contact with each other. And when I mentioned that I had lived in Toronto for three and a half years, she just about fell out of the seat. And she said, how in the world did you wind up living in Toronto? And I told her that I had been a full-time minister. Well, that was where it all started. And <laughs> she, she had this mood where she was really talkative and in a good mood. And when I said I had been a minister, and I was you know, still a minister doing some, some preaching here and there, her mood changed and she became a little bit hostile and she said, well, she said, I, I know that you're probably not going to want to sit by, beside me and uh, if, you, if you feel you need to ask to be moved, that's fine with me. And um, she said, this has happened before. And I said, well, why in the world would I not want to sit by you? And she said, well, I'm an atheist. And I said, well, that's not going to bother me. I said, I don't have any problem with that. And she said, well, you're certainly not going to want to talk to me. She said, I've, I've sat by Christians before, and they just refuse to even discuss anything. And I said, well, that's not going to affect me in any way whatsoever. I said, I'd be glad to talk with you. I said, we might even be able to talk about religion. <laughs> and she said, well, I don't know about that. And I said, well, I do. And I said, we might be able to. Now, there are three things you don't talk about in public with people is sex, politics, and religion. That's a fact. But we talked religion for an hour and a half, and I want to tell you about it, because it was interesting. She was an atheist, and she was proud of it. And, you know, our, our talk lasted for about an hour and a half, and I want to show you what I went through with her, the things that came to mind. I didn't quote scripture. I paraphrased a few here and there along the way, which she was somewhat familiar with. I don't know what her background was. I don't know if she had grown up a Christian or a believer, a believer in God or what her biblical knowledge was, we didn't even get into that. We just got into some other things. And I was you know, thinking as I was sitting there listening to her which direction I wanted to go with it. 
But the questions I have for you today is, what would you say to someone who doesn't believe in God if you had the same opportunity? Or didn't even believe in his word? Because she didn't. And it was more of a being unfamiliar with it, I think, than, than as a fact. But she just was not concerned with it, wasn't part of her life, and it didn't drive her internally. Could you carry on a conversation with them? Could you answer some of their questions? I think in the past, one of the things that we have kind of done as, as church people, and not just so much the churches of God, but even churches today, there are those who will isolate themselves from people because they're not one of the flock. They don't want to hang with them. And I don't mean live your life day in and day out with people. I'm just talking about they don't even want to talk to them. They don't even want to be around them. And I think that's unfortunate because, you know, Jesus mentioned in the New Testament he, that he prayed that God wouldn't take us out of the world, but that he would keep us from the evil. And I think too often we try to isolate ourselves from people around us where we could probably have an impact and make a headway with their lives. Maybe, you know, teaching them a few things. You know, over the years, I, I've been in business for 34 years, and I deal with all types of people. I deal with people that have been criminals. I deal with people that are on probation. I deal with people who live an alternative lifestyle, both people who have worked for me in the past and people in the city in leadership capacities who are of the alternative lifestyle. I deal with people who are atheists, who don't believe in God. I deal with people from other faiths. And one of the things I've learned is I learned to talk to people. I just have learned to be able to do that regardless of who they are. And one of the things I see when I, when I look at these people and I'm around people, just my, much like the video we saw, it's really touching. One of the things I see in these people is I see someone who has the potential to receive the Spirit of God at some point, whether in the future or in the kingdom, but somebody who also has that opportunity to be forgiven and be a part of God's kingdom. I see the potential there, even though it may not be at this particular point. And, you know, you try to work with people, you try to help people, and this world is full of problems, serious problems. <clears throat> I use uh, express personnel right now to hire people. About half my 20-some employees are through express personnel. I heard this week what the percentage is of people who cannot pass their drug screen. I had a couple go over there, sent them over there to see if they could get a job, couldn't pass the drug screen. And I asked him, I said, how bad is this? Is it about 30% of the people that cannot pass their drug screen that come to you? You know what it is? 60. 60% of people cannot pass the drug screen. So you tell me there are not problems in this world. People that just think, I mean, this is probably going to change now because of what is happening politically with with the marijuana situation and there were lawsuits filed up in, I think it's Oregon or Colorado or something, but it's a problem. It's a problem in dealing with people. But this sermon is just one way of how you can approach the situation. There are many ways you could do this. Each one of you could talk to somebody and have your own way of approaching people who do not believe. And I titled this sermon, To the Unbelievers, because you will encounter some of those. I told this particular lady that I was, I was not a biblical scholar by any means. I had learned a lot over the years, that I had been a church pastor for five and a half years, full time in the ministry, and just volunteered my time and these last few years. And I asked her, I said, why do you believe what you believe in? And again, I didn't know her background. She said that she was a science teacher and had been. She was retired. But she said that God was just a concept to her. He was not real. That God was a combination or a culmination of all the forces in the universe. Of all the laws and everything that existed. That this was, was God and this is what controlled things. And I, I had heard this before. I was not surprised by this. And she said that this was her concept of it and how she felt about it. And I said, well, where did all of these laws come from, the laws of physics, gravity, light, darkness, and time. And she said, well, 
they've just always existed. They've always been there. She said, and we talked a little more, and she, and she mentioned, well, the, the Big Bang created them. And I said, well, what about the precision that is within the universe, the order, the orbit of the Earth, the location of the sun, the planets, the, the exact tilt of the Earth is a certain degree, and scientists have shown over the years that if this was just altered uh, the slightest amount, that all life would cease, that everything would change dramatically within our you know, society and within life. The distances of the sun and the earth, if it was any closer or any further, how much that would change our, our life. I said, where did the seasons come from? And she made the statement, she said, this is one of the things that's been interesting to me to try to figure out. And so I knew I was on the right path with her. And I told her to begin with, I said, the one thing that we have to come to see and understand if we're going to talk about things is we have to have a common ground to start with. And she didn't realize where I was going with this, but the common ground that I had selected to discuss with, to discuss with her was faith. And I'll show you and tell you about that in a minute. And I asked her, I said, we have to, to agree on one thing. I said, there is either a God that does exist or there is not a God. And she said, well, I agree with that. <clears throat> so we had some place where we could start. So while I sat there and while she was telling me a few things about what she thought about life and about the universe and whatever, I, I began to think back about what we read in Acts chapter 17 with the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul went to Athens where all the idols were visible to him. And I felt much in the same situation. Here I was with someone who didn't necessarily believe in God or idols, but didn't really believe anything. And here was my opportunity to begin to explain who God was and what God was trying to do and to briefly discuss the, the facts about God. Because, you know, we, we look at Paul in Athens, which was a city at the time that had lost all of its glory. It was only a city of about 10,000 people. It was a cultural and intellectual center of the day and was very prominent in those, those terms. And these people believed in anything and everything. And they had idols of every god they could think of and even one to the unknown god, as you are familiar with, because they wanted to make sure they had covered all their bases. They didn't want to miss somebody. And here's Paul standing there. You can imagine what his thoughts must have been in looking at all these idols and what people believed in. You know, and, and you think of people that you know that believe in all sorts of different things or don't believe in anything. They just exist from day to day. And we have the opportunity to explain about the unknown God. Now that may sound a little far-fetched in, in past history, but there are people who do not know who God is and who do not understand what God is doing. And you can imagine what Paul must have felt like with all their superstitions, it says in verse 22, and how that they were devoting all their life to these gods and worshiping them. And he said, I bring to you the unknown God whom you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. And this is what one of our jobs is in life as we go through life, is to declare this unknown God to people even today. Because I think sometimes of the 21 or 22 people that work for me, there are probably two of us that believe in God for sure, maybe four of them that actually attend church off and on. The rest of them could care less, doesn't, in, doesn't interest them, it's not part of their life, not something they're concerned with, they just live from day in and day out. And that's just a small part of society that's like that. There's a lot of people that feel that way. You know, God, he says, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He, he said and talked in verse 26, the how that God had made one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. You know, this God has, has done things. This God has created things. This God has put things together. And this is something that you and I have an opportunity to teach and tell people about. And I, as I was going through this and kind of explaining some of this and paraphrasing it to her, you know, she was, she was interested. 
She had never, and I don't know, two or three times she's told me that she had never thought of it in those terms. And, and I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, there's going to be a little bit of interest where sometime in the future she may do a little more investigating and think about it more seriously as to what might happen. She even told me at the end of the, the, the flight how glad she was that we could talk, and she said I could use her story if I needed to. And I said, well, I didn't think I'd ever have an opportunity to use that. It just never crossed my mind. Well, while I was waiting between flights, I sat down and put some of these notes on some paper because I thought it might be interesting because it was an interesting flight with her, believe me. For an hour and a half, we sat there and we talked. It, was, it, it wore me out. I was tired when I got through. It really was because she had a lot of questions and I was trying to come up with some answers. I, I specifically mentioned Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. And I don't think she was that familiar with the Bible because I don't think she'd ever heard this scripture. And I told her that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they are without excuse. And she mentioned she hadn't thought of it in those terms. And I said, well, you know, our common ground is faith. I said, I believe and have faith in God and his word and the importance of what he says that, that in this book there is something factual about it. And I said, you have faith in what you believe, even though you can't prove it, that there is no God and that these laws and these activities in the universe are holding everything together. And she agreed. We both had faith, but in different things. So faith does involve that which exists, but is not necessarily something that you can explain. You can, you can believe in God, and you know God exists for a fact because of a lot of different things, but to explain that to somebody else, you don't really have the proof to do that, do you? And people will always tell you, well, if God would just do something, if he would just reveal himself, we would believe, we would know. Well, we've heard that before. But chances are that's just not going to happen. Even science backs up the creation. You know, I've, I've done a lot of research and reading in, in the past about Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was one who, when it was all said and done, said the universe could not exist without a creator because of the way things are put together, because of the precision, because of the complexity of it. And just for it to all happen at once could not have taken place. But you don't hear that too often because, well, that's not the way people want to look at things. They want to look at it in their own terms. You know, I told her that I believed in a form of evolution. She kind of sat back and looked, and she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'm not talking about the evolution of animal being and developing into a human being. I said, I'm talking about the evolution of mankind and what has happened when mankind has rejected God and gone the other direction. Verse 28 of Romans 1, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God gave them over to a mind that puzzled things where, they, where it was not helpful. There was no understanding in the way that they dealt with things. And because they had rejected God, they have to replace it with something else. And when you replace something else, in, your, in, in mankind's life besides God, you begin to go all sorts of different ways. And so, you know, the definition of evolution is an unfolding process of development or change. And I firmly believe that mankind has an un, unfolding process of development and change by rejecting God because we have gone too many different directions and not following what God has wanted. And I said, and I told her and explained about you know, mankind, and I said, when you reject God and replace him with something else, you are going to go all sorts of different directions. And I said, this is why we have so many of the problems we have today within the, within the world. And she agreed we had a number of problems that need to be corrected, that they just weren't the best. Um, anyway, we, we established a little bit of a, of a grounding of it. And I told her that, you know, when you look back in, in Genesis of chapter 1, when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that's just what took place. And you either believe it or you don't believe it. Uh, but I said there's, there's definitely more of an account of proof when you look at things from a different point of view as to how this was all put together and where we are today. And one of the things I, I had mentioned 
was the fact that when God created the heavens and the earth, what was it he did with man? He gave man dominion over the earth to subdue it. You know, one of the questions I've always had and thought of down through, through the years is, why, if mankind came from animals, if there was evolution, and you were trying to prove it, why is it along the way we've never had a planet of the apes? Man has been and always been the only one that has ever subdued the earth and had dominion over it. Planet of the Apes is a good movie, but we've never seen that happen, have we? Mankind has always been the dominant creature on the earth. Why is that? Well, God said that's what he did in Genesis, and that's where we are today. You know, the reasons we have seasons, you know, if, if you look at evolution, why would we, why would evolution be concerned with four seasons? You know, we're having winter a little bit too soon this year, I agree, but uh, that's just the way life is sometimes. But, you know, you, you look at these things, and, and people look at some of the most simplest explanations for things, as we mentioned in the Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, there is the invisible things were created, and they are without excuse. And so, we have that to look at. You know, Colossians chapter 1 talks about, and I'm not going to turn there for this lack of time, but talks about Jesus, the Creator, creating things, you know, invisible, invisible flowers, you know, and all sorts of things that have taken place were part of what He did. And yet one of the most important things about um, our faith is, you know, the, the Creator becoming, the Word becoming flesh and living a life like He did for each of us. I'm not sure she was how familiar she was with Jesus. We didn't talk too much about him. I just made mention the fact that, you know, this was where our hope is and where our hope lies. It's with what he has done. I did mention to her, you know, as far as what I believed about God's word and the importance of it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I said and told her that this was, this was faith as well. But I was leading somewhere on the second point which I think got her attention because uh, she was very well aware of that too. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, as you well know, as you memorize this, is given by the inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And she, she wasn't I don't think too familiar with the Bible because it didn't go anywhere after that. But there was an interesting article I came across a few weeks ago, one by Rick Warren called The Bible Has One Theme and That's a Miracle. And when you read this particular little article, and I'm just going to hit highlights of it, it, it kind of shows you how you can have faith in the Bible and something I think she was void of because she had never really spent much time with it. Rick Warren, I think, is the one you know that wrote Purpose Driven Life. He says, only God could have put the Bible together. It's about the scripture and faith and how important it is and how, you know, with, with what I'm going to read here, I think you'll see how complex it is. It's 66 books written over 1,600 years by 40 authors, and it has one theme. The Bible is all about God redeeming man and Jesus is its star. The Bible was written by 40 different people. Before this, he talks about the Quran and, and Buddha and Confucius and how that they wrote certain books, and they were the ones that wrote the books, the only one that wrote it, and that was it. He says, the Bible, on the other hand, was written by 40 different people at every age and in every stage of life on three continents. Prophets, poets, princes, Kings, sailors, and soldiers all had the same story. Some were written in homes, others in prisons, and others on ships. It was quite a diverse group of authors. And that's true, it really was. He said, we tend to think of the New Testament as about Jesus, and the Old Testament is about Israel. But that's not true. The Bible says in Luke 24, verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets... Jesus explained to them that what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
The New Testament wasn't even written then. It was the Old Testament. The pictures, the metaphors, the analogies, and the allusions from beginning to again are about God's plan to redeem people and build a family for all of eternity. It all began with Jesus. You can see him in every single book. And that's true. And the Bible, God's Word, says all this occurred and happened, and, and it's there, and we believe in it as part of our faith. And when you think about how many people, different people, put it together under God's inspiration, it all came out pretty good, didn't it? But again, as I will tell you and tell her, I told her later on, I said God doesn't force us to accept that, which is another point I'll get to. The second point I had that I talked to her about were the witnesses down through history. When you think of trying to understand God and what God was doing and the things that have, have taken place down through time that are mentioned in the Bible, they're there for a reason. Uh, and she said, well, I thought that and look at these as more as just stories of things that have occurred and are there to you know, read and find interesting. And I said, well, there, there are much more than that. You know, God says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 that he does things and he's going to reveal things to people along the way, which is what he's done down through history. Amos 3 verse 7 Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. That's what God has done. God has, God is rather elusive at times. He doesn't do what we expect him to do. Sometimes he doesn't reveal himself to us like we would like him to. He doesn't, you know, give us great power with the Holy Spirit, you know, to be some great leading example that people will just fall to and and want to embrace and say, oh, yes, I believe in God. God, down through history, has been, he's been elusive. He's been almost absent at times. And there's been times where he has done all sorts of things and miracles along the way to get people's attention. What good did that do except for a small period of time? Well, I think one of the biggest prophecies, and this goes back from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the book of Acts, and describes a lot of history along the way. But one of the, one of the scriptures you read back in the book of Genesis was about, I think it was, no, it was Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, it was Deuteronomy, where Moses said that there would be a prophet raised up in the future likened to him who would do certain things like he was doing, and he would be something far greater than what Moses was. And you find that in Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 22, the, Peter here is talking about the times of restitution where there, there are going to be things that are restored that have been lost. And he says in verse 22, which is a paraphrasing from back in Deuteronomy 18, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, The prophet shall your Lord your God raise up unto you and to your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. And he said that you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And the reason all the people of the earth are going to be blessed because of this other prophet that's going to be coming along, which was Jesus, was because of salvation which would be available to all of mankind. And, you know, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of him. And the whole process, like was mentioned in the article, from Genesis to Revelation, is about the life of Christ, about his ministry, about what he was going to do, and about how things would change. And down through history, there were witnesses, you know, from the very beginning as to what God was doing, just, just subtly in life and in the world, here and there. You know, God didn't force people to do anything. He called a special group of people, his people Israel. And what did he say that Israel was going to do for the world? Israel was going to be referred to as his witness. 
not only were they going to be his people, you know, he chose them. As you read back in the book of Deuteronomy, how that, you know, that God chose this people because they were not something special, because they had more people than other nations, or because that there was anything that they had to offer that was better than the other nations. But he said God chose them because they were going to be a special people to him. They were going to be his people because of the covenant that he had made with the with Abraham and because this is where Christ was going to come from, which would be the blessing for the entire world. You know, if you want to read a number of good chapters, and I don't have time to go through all of these, but Isaiah chapter 42 through about 49, there is so much in there. We'll just hit a couple spots in them as we go. But it is so much about who God is and what he is doing. And again, you have to believe in God's word as being his word. He says in Isaiah 49, and this, this talks not only about Israel, but also about Christ in verse 3. You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Oh yeah, he would be glorified because of not only the people and the nation, but also because of who was going to come from that nation. He says in verse 6, it is a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give you for a light to the Gentiles that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. This kind of culminates the entire message of what God is doing. And it's through his people Israel and through Christ. You know, I told her as we talked a little bit, I went back to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Because she made the comment, she said, well, if, if God is so important, if God is so great, if God does exist, and he is so powerful, then why doesn't he reveal himself to us so we know he exists? And this is a, this is a common thought that people have. You hear people all the time say, if there is a God, why doesn't he come down and do something and correct the problems that we're having? here in society and in life, and stop the wars and all the killing and the atrocities that seem to be getting worse and worse each day as you turn on the news. And it's going to get a lot worse. But why doesn't God just do something? You know, he did it back during the time of, of Egypt when Israel was in captivity and bringing them out of Egypt. How'd that turn out? Great for a time, but it didn't take them too long into the desert to begin questioning God and complaining about the food and the water and, and where they were living and all the things that they had just witnessed, I still can't get my mind around how they could witness all these tremendous miracles and begin complaining a few days later, going down the road. But these people witnessed this. They talked about it. They passed it on to their children. And they still went the opposite direction. And how could they possibly watch Moses go up the mountain and see God's presence up there to receive the Ten Commandments and all the conversation that Moses must have had up there with him for 40 days and to go back to build an idol after all of that. Now granted, they didn't have God's Spirit, but they were human beings and they were weak. They had just come out of slavery, probably scared to death where they were going. And, it, and believe me, it took faith in their lives to do what they did but how could, you, how could you go back so quickly the way that they did? I paraphrased Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2 to her. God who at sundry times and in different manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being in the express brightness of his glory and in the image of his person, when he had purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of God. I said, what more could God do? If you believe in Jesus and you believe that God sent his son and God allowed his son to die because mankind killed him, he was the word made flesh. I said, how in the world can you expect God to do anything else? She was puzzled by that. And I said, that's what the Bible says, and that's what God has actually done. I said, what more could he do for mankind to convince them? It doesn't take very long to turn and go the other direction, even if God, you know, performs miracles and does all sorts of things. 
she said, yeah, that was a good point. So at least I made her think a little bit to try to get her attention. We read of this hope over in 1 Corinthians 15, and I, I mentioned this to her as well. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Verse 5, that he was seen, he was resurrected in verse 4. He was seen, verse 5, of the twelve and five hundred other brethren, verse 6 when he was resurrected as witnesses to what had taken place. It didn't just happen and somebody wrote this down. People actually saw it. They were a part of it. And they knew that this had occurred. And this is why we have scripture is because of the witnessing that God has done down through the ages. You know, back in Deuteronomy, God said, by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall somebody be convicted. It's repeated again in the New Testament. And here we have the 12 and 500 that witnessed Jesus Christ, after he was dead, after he was resurrected in his power and in his glory. And they're witnesses for us to know that this occurred. And we have that opportunity to reject it, to say it didn't happen. Well, you and I know where things are headed and what has to take place. You know, people have to be, become called. People have to learn, you know, from experience and a lot of things. They have to be taught. And God is not trying to convert everybody. But, but it's a good place to start in, in dealing with somebody who doesn't know that much about God. We have, we have that cloud of witnesses, it says in Hebrews, that great cloud of witnesses that have left something for us to look at and to think about. The third point and she had never heard this. When I got done going through this in a brief way, she had never understood anything about fulfilled prophecy. And I said, this is the one proof that you have to understand and think about when you think about a God in heaven and about his word. And I said, fulfilled prophecy. Events that have taken place and were told were going to take place and have happened and are recorded in history as taking place. And I said, you can't deny that, even if you want to. I said, because it's a fact. And she said, well, I've never heard that. I've never heard anybody talk about that. And I said, well, let me give you a little insight. And so I explained a few things. For one thing in, in dealing with prophecy, prophets and prophecy form an unbroken line from the Old Testament to the New Testament. They go hand in hand. And when you think of the New Testament, when they were teaching and preaching to the people, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have what we have. All they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament exists because of the fulfillment of the Old Testament messages by the prophets. It's a fact. Both bear witness of Christ and his saving work and the salvation, as we read about in Isaiah and many other places, of Christ and what God is doing with mankind and what's available to mankind and how all nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of Christ. The Old Testament prophets were not just dreamers. They were the bearers of truth for mankind that God had given to them by His Spirit. And they were there for us to think about and to try to heed God's Word to mankind. They were, they were the authorized teachers from God to give to us messages that should be heeded. And again, you have to understand that God does not force people to accept him. That's the fourth point we'll get to is, is freedom. And I explained that to her. I said that in all the things that, that's going on within the world, within the universe, God does not force people to have to accept him. I said that just wouldn't fit. You know, the prophet's messages included supernatural knowledge of God and about events in the future. And in many cases, there was God's power that was evident by the things that they did when some of them did perform miracles. And then finally, something that you and I are a part of, the sending of his Holy Spirit to mankind that would be given to people who were called and chosen and who'd been baptized, which took place after Christ had died and been resurrected. And the Holy Spirit as you find in 1 Corinthians, the spirit of the prophet are subject 
to the prophets. So you have a line of, of knowledge that is going to follow that which has preceded it. You don't just receive the Holy Spirit, decide to do all sorts of things on your own. No, you've got a format you follow that needs to be you know, very, very visible. One of the things I asked her about, we were talking about evolution. I said, if mankind came from animals, why are there so many languages? Didn't have an explanation for that. I told her, I said, you know, God said that he confused the languages in the book of Genesis for a reason. I said, if we came from animals, why are there more languages? Why not just one? So at least I made her think a little bit, something that, that she was, was going to have to look at and research, I think. You know, one of the things that you're going to find in prophecy, and I'll just point it out to you because you might want to mark it in your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter 46 and verse 2. This is a benchmark in history. And you want to label it as such and put it there because this particular scripture, I learned this years and years ago, and even the commentaries point this out. This scripture coordinates biblical history with man's history. They all coordinate with the same time frame, time period. This date, he says, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh, Necho of Egypt, which is by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Joash, king of Judah. This took place in 605 B.C., and this is a benchmark in history and prophecy where it's accurate, where the man's history, physical history, secular history, correlates with biblical history. So keep that in mind, because that's the way you begin to look at things in history and when they occurred. You know, one of the things I talked to her about fulfilled prophecy was Daniel chapter 2. Because Daniel began his ministry in 605 B.C. He began with a man who had a lot of dreams, and he probably was a little bit terrified to go in and explain some of the dreams to this man, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And you can imagine if you were in his position how you must have felt. This king has this screwy dream. Nobody can seem to explain it. And then Daniel asks for help and is given the ability to explain it. And the first year of Nebuchadnezzar was 605 B.C. when Daniel started his ministry. And it talks about these kingdoms. He says in verse 36 of Daniel 2, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. You, O king, are... King of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, he has given into your hand and hath made you ruler over them all. And he tells him that you are this head of gold, Babylon. It's a fact of history. The head of gold, the other images, the... the um, Breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron and feet were partly of iron and clay. When you, when you read some of these things that were prophesied to take place, uh, this prophecy took place before these nations existed. You know, Babylon was the first. After that was the Medo-Persian and then Greece and then Rome. And when you, when you start thinking about down through history, you know, history very much solidifies the fact that these things did occur and this is how it happened. So fulfilled prophecy is definitely proof that there is a God in heaven who has given us things to understand and to know. And you can go through Isaiah. Like I said, we don't have time to do that, but Isaiah 42 through 45, there are all sorts of scriptures here that discuss what God is doing and how he's dealing with things. One of them in particular, Isaiah 45, another one that was fulfilled in history and something that took place was that with King Cyrus, who was of the Medes and Persians. He says in Isaiah 45, verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand have I held, to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two levied gates, 
and the gates shall not be shut. If you go back and read the history of how Babylon was conquered, it was done by diverting the river that went through the city. And Cyrus went in through the river instead of through the gates because Babylon was impenetrable. It could not be conquered. Yet God says here, he says, I will give you the treasures of darkness, verse 3, and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, which call you by the name, am the God of Israel. He says in verse 5, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded you though you have not known me. And so, isn't it interesting down through history that God can use people and deal with people who are pagans, who don't even know who he is. He can use them for his purpose. And these people don't even realize who God is and what he's doing. You know, Daniel chapter 4, we don't have time to turn there, but the seven years of punishment upon Nebuchadnezzar for claiming, you know, he was so great and so mighty and so powerful. You know, if you go back and you read any of Babylon's history, you will find that there is a seven-year period in Babylon's history where there is nothing recorded. Isn't that interesting? That Nebuchadnezzar was crazy like an animal for seven years. And God said at the end of seven years, what would happen? His kingdom would be returned to him in the same state that it was in. Nobody came in and tried to form a coup and take over. It just didn't happen. But there was no history written for that seven-year period. And these people were fanatics about recording history of their nation. Something they did. It was, it was part of life. But for seven years, that didn't happen. Just an interesting sidelight. Anyway, over in Acts chapter 1. Another scripture that talks about what is going to happen and what's going to take place, hopefully very soon. They were up on the Mount of Olives. They were all gazing into the heavens. And it was stated, you know, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you in the heavens, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. You know, what a scenario we wait for to happen and occur again. When I was in Israel a couple years ago, standing on the top of the Mount of Olives there. It's got a road goes up through it and a bus, bus stop and people get off and there's buildings there. And you're standing there on the top of the Mount of Olives and you think, you know, someday this is going to take place and it's going to happen. And wouldn't it be wonderful if it happened, you know, today. But Jesus, you know, who they said and saw go into heaven was going to return in like manner. And that's yet in the future. There are so many things that are yet in the future that have not happened that God says are going to happen. But when you start looking at some of these prophecies down through history that have been fulfilled and took place exactly the way God said they were, you've got to think that there's probably some truth to this and that his word does have some meaning. Point number four. I talked to her about freedom, God's freedom, and what he has given to mankind. Just one scripture, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. People always think God is going to zap them. I think that was her, her thought that if, if there was a God and we were doing something wrong, that God should just zap us and tell us that we're doing something wrong. We need to change our way. And I, I think I made a point with her when I got to talking about freedom because people always appreciate freedom. They really do. You can make your own decisions. You can go your own way. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to live in fear with something going to happen. But God tells us in Deuteronomy, he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. And I told her that this is what God has allowed us to do. He's allowed us to choose and decide what we want to do, what we want to cause to happen in our lives. You know, we can do it. We can either turn to him or we can reject him. Either way. But he's given us that opportunity. And I wondered as we finished our conversation, you know, I, I told her, I said, I, I was unfortunate that so many people didn't want to sit by her and didn't want to talk to her being an atheist. I said, 
that just doesn't even make sense to me because you know people <coughs> can interact on a lot of different ways and can learn from each other even though you don't necessarily agree with each other and I told her I was more than happy to sit and discuss with her and, and you know, wish we had more time to talk. And I wondered about this, the parable of the sower. I wondered where this seed would fall, what kind of rooting it would do, if any. Would it make an impact in her life? Would it cause her to, to think about things and maybe investigate a little more in the future as to you know, what was going on and what the Bible was all about? I know the best example that we can we can have is, is our word and our deed, the way we live our life. Um, I think what bothered me the most was the fact that so many Christians didn't want to sit by her and didn't want to talk to her. Because that's just, you know, Jesus dealt with a lot of sinners when he was on the earth and he was willing to talk with them and set them straight with life. And I think that's what our job really is. So I, I, I hope that is informative. It was interesting to me to sit there and talk to somebody who had no belief like I did and yet we were able to discuss some things and had a good conversation. And as, as I said, as we landed she was you know, real happy to be able to talk with me, said she really enjoyed it. And um, my one thought through all of this, you know, could she continue thinking and maybe asking some questions to some other people? about God and about His Word. I'll probably never run into her again. Just one of those freak things that happened on that five and a half hour flight. But maybe in time she will investigate. And maybe, maybe God was using this opportunity to begin to call her. You know how all of you were called at some point in time. Probably all different. You know, what led to your coming to God or understanding God. Um, in some cases it didn't have to be some dramatic miracle or accident that got your attention. It was just something that happened in your life and got you to thinking. Think about this encounter. Maybe someday you'll have the same opportunity and if you do, may God direct our steps.